Welcome everybody live to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? So great to have you with us. We've got an extraordinary guest who's joining us live from North Carolina, USA. We are blessed to have award-winning documentarian. He's an incredible filmmaker and a terrific director, award-winning too. Michael Lippert is here as we're going to be celebrating legendary jazz singer Carol Sloan. Yes, it's going to be amazing. There's a new, really exciting documentary that is out that everybody's uh, really raving about, and it's going to be featured at a festival coming up in August. We'll tell you about that as well. It's called Sloan a jazz singer, and it's something very, very moving, very inspiring, and very, very special as we celebrate the uh, legendary jazz singer's life. And um, we're so excited to have this opportunity because if you're a jazz fan, you're going to love this episode. If you love documentaries, but just really good conversations because you guys know who watch us, the love it is who watch us all around the world internationally know that we have good conversations and great entertainment here on JMS. Now, if this is your first time joining us on our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series, hey, it's good to have you with us. We hope you stop by more often. You can peruse almost a thousand episodes, binge watch them on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. We are coming at you live here in the East Coast or on the East Coast. We're in the New York area between New York and Boston along the Southern New England coast. That's where JMS is housed. Got comments coming in already from our viewers. If you want to comment when the show is live, guess what? We're very interactive here at JMS. You can comment while the show is live in our JMS Levity Hall chat room. Just subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Just click it right now. It doesn't cost anything. And you can comment and interact with your host, me, and of course our guest, and with one another. That's something exclusive we do here at the Gym Master Show Live Series. Thanks for all the comments, the posts, the sharing, all the levity that's been coming our way, emails and tweets and texts and um, sharing the links on your social media, everybody enjoying what we're doing, sort of mixing old school and new school, sort of the Dick Cavett, Johnny Carson style of uh, celebrity talk shows with a myriad of guests from all different backgrounds and celebrity friends and more with a modern twist, modern vibe of today. So cool stuff. We have two shows today, just a little teaser uh, coming up later today. We have at 7 Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, the uh, extraordinary actress, singer, and author, yes, from My Three Sons, the 1960s beloved sitcom, Tina Cole, will be joining us as well. So we call this Double Lovety Day when we have two shows in the same day. And uh, cool exciting. I was so glad to have you here. So let's dive in. Now that you know how everything works, if you're a very first time viewer of JMS, so great to have you here. Again, we are very excited to have Michael Lippert here coming to us live from North Carolina. He is an award-winning and noted director, filmmaker, producer, and uh, he's responsible for this extraordinary documentary called Sloan, a Jazz Singer. This is uh, celebrating the life of the extraordinary Carol Sloan. And we're very excited to talk about her amazing career and what she has meant to jazz and to just the music industry and to countless fans for so many years. And... Um, we really appreciate uh, all these great photos. This is courtesy of uh, Bob Boynes, really beautiful shot of Carol. This particular shot here is when she was 14 years old. And um, yeah, she's uh, not with us. And so we're going to be celebrating her life uh, in a very glorious way. There she is in more recent years, listening to the music and a tear coming down her eye. Really, if you uh, know Carol Sloan's extraordinary music, you know the legend that she is and um, the countless, countless, countless hours of extraordinary music that she has left us with. And we're going to tell you about all these incredible photos. We've got some behind the scenes shots uh, also of the making of this much talked about documentary. There's Michael right there with the incredible Carol Sloan. So we're very, very honored again to uh, have Michael with us because this is really hot off the presses. This is something exciting that's happening uh, as we speak. And again, there's going to be a festival uh, coming up as well, celebrating incredible music and showcasing this documentary. One of jazz music's greatest voices, the legendary 
chanteuse Carol Sloan, known for her vocal collaborations with such musical luminaries as Clark Terry and Phil Woods and Mike Renzi. Of course, performing alongside artists of the likes of Coleman Hawkins and Dave Lambert and John Hendricks, but also her documented associations with the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Johnny Carson and Ella Fitzgerald. And now, which is really exciting, her dynamic career is celebrated in such a glorious and extraordinary way. And uh, again, we are so excited to have this opportunity to tell you about it. And we just want to slip in a little bit more about what it is you're going to see. We've got a little bit of a clip here we can show you as well. Her dynamic career is highlighted in Michael Lippert's multi-award-winning documentary feature, Sloan, a jazz singer slated to screen in the documentary competition at the in-person edition of the CineQuest Film Festival running August 15th through the 30th with director Michael Lippert in attendance as well. Get a chance to meet him for the premiere. Sloan, a jazz singer, chronicles the life and career of underappreciated jazz legend Carol Sloan, who despite having toured and performed with some of the greatest names in the 20th century of American music, has always chased artistic perfection. Hers is a heart-wrenching, hopeful, and ultimately beautiful, untold story of faithful adherence to one's craft in the face of numerous trials and tragedies that come her way. And all of that is uh, talked about and featured within the actual documentary as well, everybody. And if you want to learn more about it, you can also go to sloanfilm.com. We will uh, tell you more about all of that and the opportunities to, um, to see it. But first, we do have, we're going to call up a, a video here. We've got an actual trailer we're going to show you. Uh, and a trailer, of course, it's like a preview, a clip of what you're going to see in the actual uh, presentation. So let's take a look at that right now. This is Sloan, a jazz singer. This is just a little uh, clip, a little trailer, but man, is it good. And then we'll be back with our very special guest, Michael Lippert, the filmmaker responsible for what you're going to see here. And um, boy, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for stopping by the Gym Master Show Live. You're going to have a good time with us today. And here's the trailer. Carol Sloan is right in there with all the greats. She's legendary now. She worked with Ella Fitzgerald and Oscar Peterson. She was traveling with both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. But she said, those were the guys who were going to change the world. I wasn't. Rock and roll washed over the country. That's what closed down the jazz clubs. She and some of her peers are not going to be remembered by the mass public. Can I ask Can you a you? question? Sure. Not to be the wrong way here. Are you famous and I just don't know it? When I was very young, the world was younger than I. How about that? I haven't heard that woman's voice in a very long time. I do not care. I really just have always wanted to if be considered right. one of the best. So I really want one more album that dream before I kick the bucket. I said, you know, let's do this. Let's do a live recording. Come on, baby. When all the Crosby's disappear. Milwaukee stops producing beer. There's people traveling from Chicago and Japan. You still can I produce what they expect? I hope I can. Plus, you've got this documentary. Here you all are. I don't believe I'm doing this. I don't believe any of this is happening. Something in myself is saying, you're not quite good enough to be doing this. And you may never get to it. How's it look? Looks like an old lady to me. Oh, oh it's going to look great. I'm not going to fall flat on my face. My voice is going to fail me. I'm absolutely terrified. All I want to do is shut this damn thing down and I go to bed. The minute you get up there and it transforms. If you're an artist, what you're expressing stays there as long as you're alive. I want to convey to the audience I have been through this. It's I can still remember the heartbreak. And somehow, I've survived. Love. 
This looks absolutely amazing. And here is our very special guest, filmmaker, award-winning director, Michael Lippert, joining us from North Carolina. Michael, welcome to the Jim Masters Show live wow. series. Pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Jim. Boy, that looks so good. Tell us about why and what inspired you to want to do a documentary uh, as beautiful and touching as this on the incomparable Carol Sloan. Well, it's uh, it's a funny story. It's not something I pursued. Um, it's uh, it's sort of a story that that found me, and I, I feel like it was an opportunity that I was um, willing to be open to. And uh, it's funny that that sort of became a theme of the film, which is sort of staying open to possibilities and dreams. Um, so I had just moved, long story short, from Chicago to North Carolina. I was uh, going to work my same job remotely. Uh, but I was sort of wondering, who, you know, what kind of film industry is down here? And I happened to connect with, um, through a mutual friend, I, I met Donna Campbell, who is a producer here and has worked on documentaries for PBS for many years. And she connected me to Stephen Barefoot, who is an executive producer who you saw in that clip. He knew Carol back in the day when she spent a, a lot of time actually in North Carolina. She came down here when work dried up in New York. And um, the two of them ran a club uh, for a brief period of time, this brief little golden period in Chapel Hill, uh, where they brought down some amazing people like Carmen McRae and others. Um, but through him, he saw a short film that I did, Stephen did, and he said, I really like this. It was a film about uh, a restoration of a, an old historic theater into a music venue. And he uh, asked me if I would be interested in this documentary about Carol Sloan. And I said, who's Carol Sloan? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, Carmen McRae, Billie Holiday, mm. Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, all the big names in jazz. And, and I am a, a jazz fan. And he said, but Carol Sloan is usually like the fifth name on the list. It's always, and then there's Carol Sloan. Mm -hmm. And so many people um, in the jazz world know who she is or know someone adjacent to her because she, when she, in her heyday, she knew and worked with just about every big name you could think of, but uh, kind of, I think was about 10 years too late to getting her start. So she, you know, in the sixties when she was really on the rise and got noticed at the Newport Jazz Festival, um, and then and and was signed on to Columbia Records almost overnight. Uh, the other thing that happened overnight was the Beatles and the Stones came and just kind of pop culture changed forever. It did, um, yeah. And so I I the, the film kind of came about because of that meeting with Stephen. And then and then I got to see her sing. And I was lucky enough, you know, while she was still with us, I was lucky enough to see her in Chicago uh, performing at a, at a club called Winters. And she did one of the things she's most famous for, which is she sang a cappella uh, hmm. for almost the duration of an entire song. She does a, a medley of My Ship and Never Never Land um, wow. musicals. And, and she, it was her idea to do that medley. And so although she hmm. was a songwriter, she was really um, creative about how she curated her songs from the American Songbook. And so uh, that she sang that at 80 something years old, hmm. um, a cappella, you know, and, and had to be in tune the moment that the piano starts playing. And she was. And that's that's the thing that um, that she can do that that a few precious others can do. Um, so long story short, I saw her and I I thought this is she's the real deal. <laughs> uh, wow. One's trying to pull one over on me. She's the real deal. And people need to know about her. Um, and then I got to know her and she's just, she was a trip. I mean, just this, you know, so, so much attitude and, uh, you know, sometimes colorful language, but, uh, uh, just had such a, such a great perspective on life and music and what it is to be an artist. And, um, and that's what this movie kind of became. What was the process like? I mean, when you're working on something like a, uh, film documentary situation, and I've had the, pleasure of being involved in several of them and 
it can be an arduous, tedious process because you want to get everything right and you want to create that certain feeling, that connection or reconnection for those who know of the person or people that you're you're celebrating and just the deep dives that you do and the research and, and talking to others who either knew the person or the person themselves that you're spotlighting. What was the process like for you, um, th you know, through thick and thin and creating this fantastic film, Michael? Well, the, in the beginning, it was I knew that I had to win her trust. And, you know, she she will talk about. Uh, you know, going on stage and playing with a, a pianist that she doesn't know or other musicians she doesn't know. And and it takes some time. And, and I felt a little bit like one of those, you know, side men trying to play with her, um, getting to know her. So I we started with just some phone calls um, and got to know her on the phone and realized she was kind of an open book. I mean, that that was uh, kind of wonderful because she just she really wanted to get the story out. She was also working on trying to write it down into some kind of book or biography. And um, so we knew that the thrust of the film was going to be this big performance at Birdland. Her bucket list item was before I kick the bucket, I want to record one more album and it'll be a live album. And she got this opportunity to sing at Birdland in New York city and Birdland for jazz fans who know, it is a historic place named after uh, the amazing saxophonist Charlie Parker um, and uh, just just kind of carries with it a huge legacy. And so for her, this show was kind of everything. She had she had spent many years out of the limelight. Uh, her husband passed away and, and she had been his caretaker and she getting into her, her 80s was finally convinced by some friends that it doesn't matter how old you are. If, if you still have that burning passion, that that's what you need to do. Um, you need to, you need to use your gift. And so she put this together with some friends um, and, uh, and got the show recorded. Um, and, and what we were doing, what my job was really was to try to document everything leading up to that. And, Or, um, before the show. And so the story kind of became this countdown to the show as she's looking back at this amazing career and kind of all the pitfalls and really examining what success means to her despite all the trials, despite maybe the missed opportunities or the, the, the um, residuals that she never got paid. <laughs> Speaking of cu current events, uh, she yeah, never exactly. got paid. Exactly. Very topical. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were working on the documentary with Carol, uh, and so there's a blessing right there, the fact that it's with and not post-haste, not after, because a lot of times things are done after somebody has passed, and right. then that's when people remember and celebrate and miss but to celebrate people when they're here yes. is even greater. So that was a gift given. Was she ill while this was happening? Was she aware of not feeling well as this documentary was being created and filmed? She, the major thing she had going on while we were filming was a bad back that was getting worse. And she had other ail ailments too, um, but she still had the energy to knock it out of the park. I mean, when she finally got up there and sang, you, would, you wouldn't know that she was in pain <laughs> but she she had back issues and then during the pandemic uh she had a stroke mm. and so um we w at that time we were done filming and i was editing but we were trying to keep in touch over the phone and um eventually uh you know n nobody had heard from her in a few days and because she lived alone a neighbor um finally found out she she had either they took her or somebody had taken her to the hospital and she, she had a fairly major stroke and uh, just kind of never was the same after that. Um, so I feel just so fortunate we were able to get this, this, that she was able to have this moment and we were able to get this for the film because I think it, uh, I think it makes the story that much more personal and emotional um, 
and, and hopefully, you know, reaches people because it's what she wanted. Um, and then she, from complications due to the stroke, she passed away early this year, actually. So she yeah, got not see, that long ago, back in January, right? Yes, in January. Um, so she did get to see a final version of the film and gave it her blessing. Wow. Um, That's amazing, yeah. huh? It's like almost waiting for, we, we just had somebody we know pass away and their birthday was a week ago, Sunday. Oh, and wow. they st had started failing and the person was 97 and they, a friend of the family, and they made it to their birthday and then a little bit the day after. And then, wow. and it was, there was a family gathering for them and uh, he was dancing and just, and then peacefully in his bed at home. Those are those you can't even write or script those kinds of things, wherever that energy comes from. But it's yes. a blessing. And in this case, she got a chance to see yep. sort of this culmination of her blood, sweat and tears and passion and joy for what she yep. did as a, an incomparable jazz performer. Oh, yeah. How beautiful that is a, a gift for her and a gift for you and everybody involved. Right. Yeah, I think she was determined to uh, to stick around long enough to get that last bucket list item done. That was number one, and finally, you know, two. It was it was I think over two years later, um, the album came out. So there was Club Club Forty Four Records, um, which uh, is run by Wayne Hahn in uh, in Nashville. They they took notice and interest in it. And uh, Mark Sendroff, who is a good friend of, of oh, Carol's, yeah. he, he helped uh, co-produce the album. He produced the album, uh, mm -hmm. but then Club 44 Records um, finally put it out and it's, it's available everywhere. And so that happened um, just maybe nine months before Carol passed away. And then the, the film premiere happened uh, one month after after she passed so it, it, she really i think stuck it out long enough to see this thing through and yeah um it's, it's almost like she kind of just knew okay i did the thing <laughs> and I now i can go. check yep. that bucket list yep. exactly so the premiere itself i mean especially with the emotion that is so raw still is i mean it's only since january or at least at the time of this broadcast um the premiere must have been quite emotional and uh, incredible. What was that like? Uh, the the premiere was wonderful. I mean, it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and and um, great spot. Yeah, really great city. Um, and uh, they ended up uh, giving us uh, the, the best documentary award, which was a huge surprise to us, um, but a big boon to our festival path. Um, but what was so great was we got there and we didn't know who was going to show up. Um, you know, uh, we, we weren't sure if, uh, you know, the film had been promoted enough for, or the festival, you know, we just didn't know who was going to show up and we came and it was a packed house mm. um, and such great reception. And there was a group of women who remembered Carol from when she sang at this place called the frog and nightgown here in North Carolina. And one of them had been a girl in those days. And she had friends who would sneak her in because it was a 21 and up or 18 and up or something. And so she could sing, see Carol Sloan sing. And they were here it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, because they'd heard about this film and they had such a strong memory of Carol. Um, and so that, that sort of thing has happened since then several times where you run into people and they're, and they're just, they just have such a great memory of Carol. She was so magnetic. And if you knew her, you probably loved her. Um, and so it, it just kind of brings home the, um, the, uh, the whole idea of this, which is she's somebody you should know. She's somebody who has contributed to the great American songbook, which is uh, all the great jazz standards that we think of. But, but she really was a serious singer. She wasn't just trying to be a cabaret showgirl singer type she was the real deal she was an artist and she had a a specific technique and um we we just felt it was going to be good for audiences to learn about that um and really delve into um the music that came 
the, the music that came first in a way that's that's very American. What are some things about Carol the person that you learned as you were not only speaking with her and sort of documenting her life with her there before you, but also in other digging that you did and maybe other folks that you spoke to, uh, obviously, you know, you had the task at hand and celebrating this extraordinary artist, but then also the human being, the person, what makes her tick, where she comes mm. from. As I mentioned, the, the, the joys and pleasures and happiness, as well as the trials, tribulations, and tragedies that happen to really all of us in our lives. What are a few things that stand out as you were creating this masterpiece that still stick with you today, Michael? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked that because I think a big part of making a story impactful for me anyway is um, in the documentary world is really having a, a subject, getting to know that subject as intimately as possible. And so it, like you said, it was a gift that we were able to record her while she was alive. So we not only got to hear all these great stories about her interactions with famous people from Miles Davis to Oscar Peterson and Ella Fitzgerald, but we also learned that she's uh, and she was an avid football fan, huge New England Patriots fan. And sh we spent one whole day just watching football because she didn't want to go anywhere or do anything but watch football. And then she wanted to watch movies with us. And um, you just it, it was as much of a production as it was just kind of befriending this this incredible human who is in many ways, just like all of us doesn't see herself or never, never really saw herself as that special. Um, and yet she was also aspiring to this, what she considered to be the greatest kind of musical artistry. Um, her, her inspiration was those, those four women I mentioned before, she called them the great quartet, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Billie Holiday, Carmen McRae. And those, those women, those, those black singers were, uh, instrumental in her entire career and studies. And so one of the other big things I learned was just a wealth of information about jazz history and how important that history was to her, how important it was to her um, that people know uh, about these singers because she felt that a lot of, a lot of singers today, and this is not a knock to anybody today, but she felt that sometimes they weren't informed about these people or they didn't know who Ella Fitzgerald was. Um, but if we don't know where the music comes from and why it sounds the way it sounds um, and don't understand the, the cultural uh, origins of things, um, then we can't be a proper student and we, and, and our interpretation is going to be lacking. And so um, I don't know. I just became her student for a week and just, mm -hmm. She did most of the talking. Uh, I'm talking a lot now, but she um, she just talked and talked until she said, hey, you guys are making me talk too much and I'm not going to have a voice <laughs> for this show. Um, so she, she had I a good sense of humor, huh? Witty, oh, quick. Yes, yes. She would tell us she hated being filmed and didn't want us following her around. But then she would turn and, uh, you know, give us a little. Uh, a little wink while holding up her mug that, that you know, that, that said drama queen on it, you know? Um, so she was just, she was, she was a hoot. You know, sometimes when you work on projects with people, projects that take some time, you develop a relationship, a friendship and a fondness for one another an appreciation for what others gifts are. Did that happen for you and Carol? Did it, you know, feel almost, you know, sometimes it can almost feel like they're a, a longtime friend or a member of the family in a way, just because intimate details of one's life, they're being open and real and raw and authentic before your eyes and you're documenting it. So yeah. there is a closeness that sort of is the icing on the cake that is developed. Did that develop to, for you and Michael? Uh, for oh, you and yeah. Carol, that is? Yes. I mean, a hundred percent. I think um, part of what drew me to this story, in addition to uh, an interest in jazz and music. Um, was it she sort of uh, 
you know, reminded me of people that I had known growing up. Uh, my, my mother was a singer and, or had aspirations to be a professional, was never a professional singer, but, um, Certainly you know, know so Carol reminded you of her. Yeah, absolutely. And my grandmother and just things, you know, my grandmother always had jazz playing, um, in her living room. And so it, it was, uh, it, it did start to feel familial. And there was a point towards the end of the week when um, I wanted her to kind of go back and remember some of some of the music and how it, how it came to be or how it came to be recorded. So we had her listen to um, some of her original recordings and you showed that image before of her kind of wiping a tear. Um, well, that became, I think that became probably the closest thing to just having a really, really, um, close moment with her because she she listened back to uh, the recording that really got her noticed. And she had gotten this opportunity to sing at the Newport Jazz Festival in 1961. Um, and nobody, you know, it's, it's this kind of amazing story because it was a matinee performance. She was part of this kind of rising stars group and a lot of the critics that were in the audience were a little bit cynical. They, they were kind of saying, who is this girl? She's probably somebody local, probably not that great. We're just going to get through this and then get on to all the big acts because there were other people there um, that were, you know, major, uh, major names, Thelonious Monk and, and others. Um, but she, she sang, she did the thing. She did the acapella thing with the song Little Girl Blue. And the pianist didn't know the verse. Um, so she just sang it a cappella until they got to the chorus. And when they got to the chorus, she was dead on. Um, and watching her listen to that and think back to that moment, um, just just like brought forth a, a flood of tears and just uh, memories about I think who who she hoped she would be as a star and but also the 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 joy of knowing that she had that moment too and um that, I mean it was very much still still in there um she said I haven't heard that voice in a very long time but but other people will say that her voice never really changed that she was always kind of the same um you know so I, uh I don't know if that answers your question no, but it does and I I can relate to it I understand what you're talking about it's um sometimes even tough to put in words because it's there's a lot of uh emotion connected with it I I had a chance to work on a documentary for a woman who was a beloved renowned uh visual artist painter drawer uh, I mean she would draw she's been drawing since she was age 5 with sketch paper her mother gave her she was 91 when we were filming her out in Burbank, California, I was sent out, you know, for some of my professional work. So I was the host producer, the interviewer and sort of producing it. And uh, we won a bunch of awards for it. It was terrific, but wow, no, we went to her home and her home studio was attached to the house. Her husband had passed away years ago. She never had children and she was an only child. So her art, her world was painting and mm. drawing and just really, and I felt that energy the minute I walked in, that this was her heaven. This was her nirvana. This is her sweet spot. And there was such a self-imposed, not by you know the network or anybody else, but self-imposed uh, energy, <laughs> that burden, that we had to get this right, that there had mm. to be warmth and it had to be something that people, even with the choice of underscoring music and, and being involved in the editing and all, it had to be something that wasn't just factual. It had to have a feeling. It had to sort of, in a way, sum up this extraordinary artist, but this incredible person's life. And she was a little guarded in the beginning, a little reserved. Here we are coming in with the cameras and, you know, who is this and everything. And, and even though we had done a radio episode before, this was something different. We were coming into her world. And um, did you get that? Did you get that vibe? Were you, did you self-impose this burden of we got to get this right? 
people, I want people to feel it, not just, you know, enjoy it. I want them to be left with a feeling of the essence that this human being mattered and really contributed such incredible artistry and beauty and care for our world. Wow. It was yeah. incredible. I mean, I, it was very emotional. And when it was done and I watched it, she and I were on the phone for three hours. She at 91 was tearing. I was welling wow. up as well. And she also, same thing. This is why I can plug in since passed within one year of that being done and completed at 91, 92, she, she passed. And wow. it was almost as if like with Carol, this is something that had to be done to summarize the existence. Did you feel that's a long winded commentary, but did you feel similarly that you had this self-imposed burden yeah. to really get it right, but also create this feeling and this appreciation for who this, this lady Carol Sloan was? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I think there's a huge responsibility, not just to Carol, but to the music. Because if I was going to do justice to her story, I also had to do justice to jazz. In her mind, the two are not, they're not two different things. So um, it became a tribute to the history of jazz uh, as much as a tribute to her. And so I want people to watch it and, and not only take away the great artistry of Carol, but to look at, look at the legacy of music in this country um, that came from so many great, uh, black artists and musicians, and she's interpreting that, became a student of that. Um, and so to me, there was a huge responsibility. And I, and I think, you know, uh, we're living in a time where acknowledgement is just so important. Um, representation's important, uh, you know, whether it's a uh, forgotten female singer uh, or, or where the music came from in the first place, uh, both of those things were just so important. And so um, putting that together, we had a, just a wonderful team that came together uh, through friends of Stephen Barefoot's and other, other contacts, people kind of just, because there's such a big uh, kind of niche fan base for Carol, we found people that were willing to do research for us. Um, mm. We had people researching. Uh, one of our co-producers went to the Library of Congress and found um, the original recording of her at Newport, blowing wow. everybody away. And we were able to use that in the film. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question, it's a big yes, huge responsibility. Um, but it really took a, kind of a whole team of people, um, you know, not just me, hardly just me. If it had just been me, it wouldn't uh, wouldn't be what it is. But there's a whole village that's been looking into this. And then one of the biggest things is, of course, the music and the music licensing. And so that um, not only a responsibility in terms of the uh, you know historical um, just, just how historic it is, but, but we also had a, a big, a big bill, a big financial uh, responsibility. So we, we did a, a fundraising campaign. It was a, it was a um, adopt a song, so people could kind of um, contribute an amount and adopt one of the songs that we're using um, that Carol was known for, and that was successful. However. Um, it was only enough to get us into the, the festival market for a year. And so we're actually starting a second leg of, of fundraising, uh, which you can find more out about on sloanfilm.com. Um, and, uh, and that's and the that, cover the cost just of being able to use the music itself. Right. So right. And all that's involved. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, if somebody had uh, told me how, you know how difficult music okay. licensing was going to be we we might have thought twice about this it's a um, big thing right yeah it's a big thing but but we're getting there and we're learning and um a lot of it is uh you know is just going to be re relying on i think the um the community that uh that loves carol and loves this kind of music and wants to keep it alive and so What's important to us and what was important to Carol is is that it does survive and that it survives not only on our 
computers and Spotify, but that it survives in person and that we can still go to a theater and watch somebody breathing and sweating and breathing the same air and um, just that that organic thing you can really only get with with uh, something like live jazz. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of talking about two different things, but just that uh, I think that is the that's what we're really aiming for here is to be able to complete a film uh, about this great music, but help people understand that um, jazz jazz is about improvisation. It's about seeing it live. It's about being there in person and it's about community and artistry um, and things that are very universal. Um, it's not just a music genre. Um, so Right. And you had always enjoyed jazz and were an aficionado of it in certain ways, or did this enhance that, this working on this documentary with Carol? Certainly enhanced it. I um, became a, a fan really in college. I, growing up, my grandma always had it playing on the radio or in her car. And I sort of just associated it with, with that, but I didn't know much about it. And then I did a play in college called Sideman um, about kind of an aging trumpet player. And I, I played a, a supporting part in that, but it really. That's cool. That sounds really, like a great story too. It is a great story. Um, should check it out if you ever get a chance. Uh, it, is that at sloanfilm.com as well? Um, not the, not that play. No, I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just called Sideman. I forget who wrote it, but um, so I was in a production of that and it made me kind of study jazz a little more. And the director really wanted us to kind of listen to uh, specifically this recording of a night in Tunisia and just what the instruments are doing and how um, just how ingenious those players were in the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. they're creating compositions in the moment. Yes. Uh, the riffing the, and everything is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that that really hit me. And, and I just that improvisational live organic thing is really what got me. And then moving to Chicago, it's a great club um, called the Green Mill where they, they play jazz nightly. Uh, and I would go there a lot. I still go there when I go back um, just to just to hear live jazz and feel like you went back in time 60 years. Um, Do you play an instrument? I play guitar and I, I sing a little bit. Um, it's funny, my daughter's starting to take piano and I, I'm i starting to get jealous of her because I'm like, <laughs> I should have stuck with that. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, so um, ja yeah, I, I certainly, uh, getting to know Carol increased my knowledge of not only the music, but the history behind it. And that was so important to her was just getting, getting the history right. Um, what are some other things that you sort of appreciate and discovered about Carol uh, along the way? And we're showing some really, maybe you can even mention what we're showing, some of these cool shots sort of behind the scenes, the, yes, the that making one, of in a way. The one where you're really close on her face, uh, she's getting her makeup done right before Birdland. And she's saying stuff to her makeup guy who was her longtime photographer, actually the guy doing her makeup also photographed most of her album covers including uh, other other big names um i think he did a u2 album and, and a bunch of others but he uh he was always a good friend of carol's and she's saying to him uh you did too much you did too much eyeshadow on this eye uh you need to you need to even it out and and he would just drive <laughs> her nuts um but she, it was how she was just working through her nerves because she she was always very nervous before a show and would say she really didn't settle in till about 10 minutes after she started performing. Right. Um, this was one of the first things we filmed when we got to Stoneham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston, where she lived. Uh, we wanted to just follow her on her daily routine. We didn't really want to stage it too much. So we went in this grocery store. We had no idea if they were going to let us film. Um, and this guy, Mr. Mr. O'Connor, he was so nice about it. Um, you know, had that classic uh, Boston, New England accent. Mm -hmm. Pasica. Yeah, exactly. That's it. We're going <laughs> to Hartford. 
<laughs> I, it could not have been a more perfect introduction to Carol because she I have a few that. relatives that have that accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And, Red but, socks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he's, you, you get my good side, right? Yeah. And it, yeah, they, they just hit it off talking about baseball and stuff. But he, he says, now you got these cameras following you around. Are you somebody famous? And I just don't know it. And she says, well, if you like jazz, you might know who I am. And he said, oh, I like jazz. What, what instrument did you play? <laughs> she said, well, I'm a singer. And it was like that became the first five minutes of the actual film because she literally tells you who she is in yeah. such a, an organic way and kind of like jazz. It just came together in the moment. Um, but it was just, it was just perfect. And then she had us, uh, get all her groceries and get all her, uh, you know, liquor for the week and, uh, <laughs> we, were, we were good to go. Um, yeah. And that's us setting up and her telling me that she looks like uh, Barbara Bush and she, she wants to do all her makeup. Um, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> And that's her singing. I think she's humming to a Carmen McRae song in that photo. Um, mm. She was she was actually really good friends with Carmen McRae. Where did she and make her home? Where did she make her home? It was in Stoneham, Massachusetts. Stoneham, yeah. Mm -hmm. She was from born in Rhode Island. Rhode Island. And we're actually yeah. going to be screening in Rhode Island at Flickers Rhode Island International um, in August. Uh, we think it's oh, going to be August. 12th but that's unofficial uh, but i mean it's officially screening we just don't have the full schedule yet um but so she was born in rhode island so that'll be a big one for us because yeah a lot of, a lot of her fans are there and she's in their music hall of fame and, and the then jazz she, festival is right around that time as well uh, newport yeah oh yeah and newport is where she got her first um record yeah. with columbia records we were just there um, on vacation a week ago it's newport rhode island's fabulous oh, wow. we love oh. it we love going there yes um, yeah, and it, this was, uh, we had, um, we had a really great photographer, uh, whose name is escaping me, but she took some just amazing photos, uh, of Carol while we were there. And this, this one's incredible. Just the, in these shirt. shots from Bob Boynes, we want to give him, uh, credit. Yeah. Here, these two uh, shots. Bob, I think it's Bob Bonus. I, bonus. I don't, okay. For a while I thought it was Bonus than Boynes. Oh, I Bonus. Think I like that. He yeah. we're, we're giving was, Bonus credit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, bonus points. For bonus them. points. Beautiful um, shots. So we appreciate that. Yeah. He, so he took a lot of these photos. Thing, something that people don't know. And I, I actually think there might be a, a documentary about him. But he um, has this whole archive of photos he took of different musicians because he managed a bunch of different people. And so he managed oh, that's nice. um, the it's, Beatles it's and the Stones on their first uh, North American tour. Wow. He would and be she, somebody to chat with. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. And he's no longer with us, but he, Oh, he's uh, gone. Huh? Boy. Right. You know. But I, it, he has, um, people managing his library and we were lucky enough to work with them and, and license some of those photos. But she, so she got to tour with the Beatles on that tour. I mean, she wasn't singing with them, but she shared, a hotel and hung out with them. She has a story you remember from the film where she goes to the Apollo theater with the Rolling Stones to see BB um, uh, King and they have to run away from all the rabid fans that are trying to tear their clothes off. And um, so she was caught in the middle of this crossroads in American pop culture where she was trying to do the jazz thing but that was fading from the mainstream. And then you had all these new guys coming in that she was also a fan of and also kind of mingled with, but it was very clear to her that they were going to, um, they were going to take over and jazz was going to take a hit. And, and much of her career sadly is about not, not only not getting the artistic recognition, but not getting financial recognition at all. She never earned any residuals. She never, um really had an agent because she just wasn't she wasn't a salesperson she was a singer and she that's all about the music the art yeah and she didn't know what to do with money um and so sadly that became part of her story and and she found herself just destitute time and time again bankrupt mm. all these things so um again we just hope this this film can kind of resurrect what uh what kind of promise she had in the 60s but then just also make people aware of the the, the kind of insane talent 
that that she had. I mean, she she knew and worked with so many famous folks. Uh, Barbara Streisand asked her asked her for advice before she became the Barbara Streisand we all know now. She saw Carol singing at the Village Vanguard in New York and said, "How do you how do you do that?" And I Carol said, what you do, oh, man. Man. <laughs> and she was just this young girl in a T-shirt and jeans and just unassuming. And then later she learned, oh, that's that girl that's on Broadway now. <laughs> you know, she didn't even know who Barbara Streisand was at the time. That's so incredible, huh? Yeah. Tell us about some of the other incredible things that you've had an opportunity to work on as well. Your prolific uh, award winning filmmaker and director. Uh, well, yeah, I, I you compliment so well. Um, I so I I work um, my my main job uh, is for Cutter Studios in Chicago. They're a post production house, and we work with a lot of ad agencies and uh, do a lot of commercial work. So I've done work um, for for various brands and uh, some of the recent Super Bowl stuff for for Jeep. Um, and so I've been very fortunate to work in in that world as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's I've been there about 15 years, and then and then I also just have uh, various film projects, both documentary and narrative. Um, I've got um, a couple of uh, sort of psychological thrillers um, that are a little bit more in the sci-fi realm um, that went to festivals a few years ago. When one was about a a uh, time traveler uh, who was using celluloid film to time travel. And then another was about a, uh, a woman um, struggling with mental illness who believes she's destined to go to, to Mars, but it's really a more of a mother son story and about trying to hold on to reality. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in all kinds of filmmaking and um, documentary is something that, uh, it's funny how life kind of takes you on different paths. And it's something that yeah. I've, I've discovered. I really, I love, and I think I have, I think I'm okay at it. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep doing that. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, just kind of building, building the, building the portfolio here. And we're very excited Good. for Cinequest coming up in August. Tell uh, us about the, that. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. So, uh, we are going to be having our Bay Area premiere at Cinequest Film Festival. August, uh, the festival runs the 15th through the 30th, but we're going to screen August 23rd and 28th. And I will be there for August 23rd. So if you want to see the film, uh, if you are in the area, uh, please come by San Jose. Um, and I know they're a very reputable festival. They bring out a lot of big names. Um, and, uh, uh, they, they give, I think they give like something called the Maverick spirit award every year. And they've given that to Harrison Ford in the past and some other, some other bigger names. So we're, we're excited for the, uh, potential coverage here. And, um, really we're, we're trying to, you know, the ultimate goal is to raise awareness of Carol's story any way that we can. And I think what I'm learning in this, this kind of new world of distribution is, that um, you have to figure out where your audience is and how to reach them. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that you're going to get this amazing deal at Netflix or HBO, but it might mean that you figure out where to reach the specific group that you want to reach in a really impactful way that you couldn't do any, any other way. There's um, a documentary uh, that I was recently inspired by that, that, uh, was kind of about people being active as they get older and they realized that their their demographic was really going to be at retirement homes. And so they found a lot of success that way because they just went directly to them. So we're, mm -hmm. we're having a lot of conversations about what, you know, how we can use um, festivals like Cinequest, but also our own kind of knowledge of our, our fan base to, to leverage, um, promotion for this film what do you hope people are left with when they watch and enjoy sloan a jazz singer i hope people are left with a sense of hope um, because i think there's a lot 
of darkness in her life that that comes out in the film and there's a lot of negativity and uh you know natalie douglas who's one of the singers that we interviewed uh, about carol she she says something like um if if you're trying to be a singer because you want a private jet and five houses then don't be a singer because you're probably not going to get that um and you have to decide what success is and i think carol's uh definition of success was more artistic about artistic achievement and so I, I want people to come away feeling empowered to chase that artistic achievement um one of the one of the signs that is up in one of the schools where she gave uh, uh um lessons to some students there's a there's a scene where you see a sign up on a, on a um, column and it just says uh risk fail risk again and that's kind of the story of her life and i think that's that's kind of the um what artists should try to carry with them you know we're all risking something whenever we make art if it's art it's a risk and you might fail but you get back up and you do it again because you feel that you you have to it's what you're made to do um and she felt she was made to sing so um yeah, if you want to learn more about the film, sloanfilm.com. Um, there's also uh, goingbarefoot.com has uh, a lot of the information as well. And that's Stephen Barefoot's site. And that has more about the um, uh, the fundraising effort that we're, that we're still doing. And yeah, just follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. Um, Sloan Jazz Film on Instagram. So um have you heard just, from any members of her family who maybe have seen it and have fallen in love with it as well yeah she um so her uh her husband uh had, had a daughter uh who came to the screening that we had in new york and um she's she's loves the film and we've had uh just a lot of her family though was gone before her um so mostly her family was her friends in the industry and um a lot of those people have come out in just full full support um there's a great singer Catherine russell uh who we got to interview for the film and she is touring the world right now doing jazz everywhere but she's been a huge um you know cheerleader for us and and natalie douglas who i mentioned before and um i i think it, it just speaks volumes about who she was that she's no longer with us but people are becoming her megaphone um her her fans and her confidants and the people that knew her well um still want to make sure her story is told and they're that they're 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 loving it um so that's the best isn't it yep. when you get that kind of feedback from people who really Absolutely. truly knew who this person was even off stage and off camera um, oh, yeah. you get that thumbs up from them it's a beautiful thing so congratulations on this uh, michael this really is a knock it out of the park film and i think people whether they have been longtime carol sloan fans or not are going to get something really very special out of it and uh going to give them a real appreciation for for jazz like you said for music itself and the importance of music being the universal language, music and humor being universal and great healers too. Yes. And of course, uh, either a rekindled love or newfound love for the incomparable uh, Carol Sloan. So congratulations to you and your team. And uh, this was great having you on. I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely yeah, have with absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. And uh Again, if people go to uh, the website, they can find out about the festivals, the showings, and where generally can they see it? If they're like, okay, well, I want to watch it. I want to watch it now. Or Well, it's only in festivals for now. Right. Uh, we, we can't really show it publicly uh, outside of festivals. Um, but the hope is that once we secure uh, all the rights to the music, through our fundraising effort and we can dis distribute the film, whether that is through streaming or, um, or we distribute it ourselves, um, that, uh, that's when we'll be able to announce where, where we can, where people can view it. Um, so for now, so go film, here. Um, yep. Right. That's it. Well, this was awesome, my friend. And 
stay in touch with us. Keep us posted on all the cool things that are happening uh, when you're in Rhode Island as well and her home state, little Rhodey. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was really terrific. Thanks for, again, doing this film and celebrating this iconic figure who, like you said, didn't really get necessarily her due. But in a way, it is coming in her direction through this fabulous docu uh, documentary. And uh, spread the word about our show, too. If you know other folks you think would like to stop by uh, JMS, they're welcome to join us. Like we say, Absolutely. it's conversational. Uh, nothing scripted. We just have good conversations as opposed to interviews here. And uh, this was really a true pleasure, Michael. You bet. Oh, pleasure's all mine. <laughs> Put that in writing and address it management, as my always my father has always said. <laughs> <laughs> you be well, my friend. You take right. care and congratulations once again. And thanks for taking time to stop by the Gym Master Show Life Series. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. You be well. Congratulations again. Bye. Cheers. All right. Was that not cool or what? Here is the uh, website again, sloanfilm.com. You can check it out. And our very special guest, award-winning filmmaker and director, Michael Lippert, joining us. And we showed some cool photos and things that he and his team sent our way that we wanted to share with you as we celebrate uh, this iconic jazz legend. Learned a little bit more about her and uh, what it took to do what she did and do so well. And uh, also behind the scenes, you know, of the making of this documentary, which everybody's raving about. And uh, it's called Sloan, a jazz singer, celebrating uh, the ups, the downs, the true life of this authentic individual with her wit and wisdom, Carol Sloan. And if this is the first time you heard about Carol, uh, well, that's cool too, because that always, uh, we don't need this anymore. That's always cool because now you got a chance to appreciate and discover and dig in deep with somebody else uh, who was beloved within the music world as well. We're going to wrap up here. I am your host, Jim Masters. Hey, gang, if you enjoyed this episode, put you to work a little bit here. Give it a thumbs up. Yeah, there's a thumbs up icon on the YouTube channel. If you're watching on our YouTube channel at our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, you'll see a big thumbs up that looks maybe not as sparkly and as golden as this does, but it is a big thumbs up. Give it a thumbs up, which is actually a like when you do that. And leave a comment. Drop a comment on the actual channel as well. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And when you do, be sure and click the notification bell. There's a little bell-shaped icon uh, next to subscribe. And when you subscribe, there's no cost. It doesn't cost you anything when you subscribe. And, um, and we have to say that so you know that when you subscribe to the channel, which costs nothing, um, and you click the notification bell, you will receive notifications from us about all the episodes, all the extraordinary guests, all the entertainment, all the great conversations, pop-up shows, surprises, everything we do, and all the different times too, because sometimes we uh, we'll broadcast later in the day, live. Sometimes, like this episode, is earlier in the afternoon, working around my TV and radio on-air schedule professionally and working around our guest schedule. So we popped this one in in an afternoon time for everybody who's watching live. And don't forget, you can see all these episodes again if you miss anything. If you pop in late and you're like, oh, I joined it too late or I forgot it was on. Well, click the notification bell. You'll always be alerted, so it'll remind you. But um, if you pop in late or you totally miss because other things happen in your life, but you don't want to miss one of our episodes, we do archive everything on the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So check that all out. And thanks for stopping by. We hope you enjoyed this conversation, this episode of JMS. I do want to remind you, that we have uh, <clears throat> somebody special joining us coming up. There you go. <laughs> coming up later. This is uh, one of those days where we have two guests. We call it double lovity. You know, the iconic beloved 1960s series, My Three Sons, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Tina Cole, who starred as Katie Douglas from the iconic television series, the sitcom. She's going to be with us live 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. 
She's also a phenomenal singer as well and a brilliant author. She's got a new book out, her memoir, My Three Lives. She joins us as well here on the show. If you're watching this episode later in the archives, you know, two years from now, then this is past tense, but you can still see the episode. Also wanted to let you know that tomorrow, for those uh, joining us, the incomparable singer Mila Williams is going to be with us, lead singer from the very popular 90s trio 702. She's also a brilliant author. She's got lots to say and lots to share as well. We're very, very excited about that. That's tomorrow, also at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And also, we have two shows tomorrow. Album Music is going to be with us, the incomparable Flamenco Fusion Duo. They're going to be with us, and we're very, Barbara and Albert, and we're very excited about that. That is coming up on Friday at um, 4 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Eastern, and that is 1 p.m. Pacific, all right here for you on the Gym Master Show Live Series. So very, very cool stuff. Lots coming up here for all of you, and we thank you for uh, all of your passion and your excitement and uh, let's take a look at some of the comments. Don't forget, if you want to support what we do, there's Super Chat, Super Moji, Super Stickers. That's available in the Lovety Hall chat room, and the chat room is available. And I just want to say thanks to all of you who watch all the time, who are incredibly loyal to what we've done here. We got people through the crazy pandemic when we started this show, and, um, and some of you, good deal of you, are still with it, and we love that. And there's so many new people who've discovered the Gym Master Show Live series. We welcome all of you as well. But to those of you who've been with us, loyal, faithful, not fair weather viewers, but you've just been with us and rooting for the series and loving it, we say thank you very, very much. And again, support Super Chat, Super Emoji, Super Stickers. That's in the Lovely Hole chat room. Or at any time, 24-7, super thanks. That's uh, available. It's a little heart icon on the YouTube channel. That's under every episode of our series. All right. Um, Kathleen Walker, who is a big supporter of our series, says thank you for being here, Michael. Good luck with all you do. Thank you very, very much. She also adds in thanks, Jim. Great show. We appreciate that. Yes, it's a double lovety day. You got it. Maureen in Arizona, another faithful lovety, big supporter of our show. Excellent conversation. What a joy to learn about Carol and her incredible career. Thank you, Jim, for another Out of the Park episode. The pleasure is all mine. We appreciate that and all these great comments coming in. Thanks for all the, the lovety that you guys have been spreading here. And uh, this is cool stuff. So we are going to uh, wrap up this episode. If you want to know more again about the film, sloanfilm.com, and it's celebrating the life of the incomparable Carol Sloan. The name of the film documentary is Sloan, a jazz singer, created by filmmaker, award-winning filmmaker and director, and our special guest in this episode, Michael Lippert. For all of us here at uh, the Gym Master Show Live, we say thank you for being with us. We'll be back for our next episode. And uh, it's always cool to have you here. You guys take care. Be well. And uh, don't forget, you can binge watch almost a 1,000 episodes on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. See you on the next one. Take care and be well. Love you all. Cheers. <laughs>